So we were talking about 18th century architecture and the, the idea of, of really the transition into neoclassical architecture. And I, I, I talked about the fact that, you know, we, we started the semester with the Renaissance, which was a, a rediscovery and a reworking of, of classical Roman Greek architecture um, by, you know, Europeans, um, especially starting in Italy, but spreading throughout much of the rest of the continent. And then that evolved into a Baroque style of architecture, which used the Renaissance as its, you know, sort of basis, uh, but just sort of made alterations and changes and tweaks to, to that, you know, adding curves, adding ornamentation and decoration, working more with light and with more creative geometries. And then this evolves into, in the 18th century, into what we call neoclassical. And it was really almost, you know, getting rid of a little bit of the excesses of the Baroque in the ornamentation and the wild curvatures and going back to uh, the, a little more of the simplicity of the Renaissance, but at the same time changing from what had been Renaissance architecture to um, adapting um, architecture to the the buildings of this era, including early industrial revolution buildings. We talked about the, uh, the salt works as show uh, by uh, Claude Ledoux in France and how, you know, this was an early planned community uh, 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 where they processed, you know, salt and, um, you know, the break in architecture from just pure Palladium, pure Renaissance to, to those funky square elements on the columns uh, or, you know, massive drum on the toll gate that we saw at the toll houses by Ledoux. And a, another good example is um, the work of Carl Friedrich Schinkel. Uh, he is a German architect. Uh, most of the, or the examples I'm going to show you are in Berlin including this first one here, the Schauspielhaus, uh, which is basically a theater. Uh, Haus in German is house, uh, and Schauspiel means sort of the house of theater or something like that, my rough German translation. Uh, this is, a, you know, a little late in the era, you know, uh, this is 1818 to 21, so it's just into the 19th century, but, you know, time timelines don't always fit, you know, the, the century dates quite perfectly, so... Um, we're seeing a continuation of that uh, neoclassical 18th century architecture into the early 1800s. Here's an image of Schinkel. Um, uh, we're starting to get away from the uh, powdered wig, uh, the powdered wig era that, uh, and the puffy hair <laughs> that we were seeing for a while. And uh, by the early 19th century, we're into uh, maybe a little more traditional looks here. Schinkel was an incredibly talented architect, um, really one of the most significant early German architects, certainly from this era. So here is a, a line rendering of the Schauspielhaus. And uh, this is the type of thing, I'll just a uh, quick little note. I probably won't make you spell <laughs> Schauspielhaus from memory. Uh, I know that some of these uh, names can be a little bit tricky and difficult. Um, it's not your native language, so, uh, but you should still be able to identify this from a list. If I give you a, uh, you know, a multiple choice, um, you know, I show you an image of this, uh, you should still know it's the Schauspielhaus and be able to pick that out. Uh, so here it is, um, pointer, and, and we're, again, we see some of the basic tenets of, of really Renaissance architecture that we have been talking about that has a Roman temple front portico out front with a grand staircase. You can you know, clearly see these are ionic uh, column orders. Uh, there's even decoration or ornamentation in the pediment like Greek and Roman architecture often would have had. Uh, and you know, the rest of the building is relatively you know, neoclassical Renaissance element in that you, know, you can see pilasters and entablatures, pretty straightforward. Uh, what really pushes this into something that's more neoclassical is what's happening on the top. This is a theater building, and as such, it requires a very large interior space that's very tall, very voluminous, voluminous right? You know, a huge volume for that theater inside. And that's not something, you know, that was quite as common in the Roman era, and <clears throat> not even that common. They didn't have grand theaters in the, um, in the early Renaissance. 
so this is an example of, of, of adapting that architectural style to a, a contemporary need. And so we see this giant um, element here on top, you know, that sort of towers, this large mass that towers over top of the building. It's all in a sort of neo, you know, you know, classical inspired design, but it goes beyond the type of forms that we would have seen certainly in antiquity, but also in the early Renaissance era. And here's a here's a postcard view. I like collecting old postcards. Um, I think I found this online. But anyway, um, and there's a you know actually another neoclassical church uh, that you see with a tower on it. Look how the proportions of it are a little different than what we would uh, have seen in the kind of Brunelleschi, Michelangelo type domes of the Renaissance. And it's a very tall drum and a you know uh, and then the dome on top of that. <clears throat> So the scale is is much much taller uh, compared to the base. But the Schorspiel House that we're actually talking about here is on the left, and you can again see how it has this very large volume of uh, mass on top of the otherwise more traditional uh, sort of Renaissance inspired base with the with the temple front. And here's a picture view, uh, standing out front, straight on elevation view, and again you know, very, very um, accurate, proportionally accurate uh, ionic temple front, uh, even with fluted columns. And like I said, they had the, um, the you know, ornamentation in the pediment, like we would expect to see in an ancient Greek temple. But this mass on top uh, is, is something completely different. The other great example I want to show you, uh, which is not too far away in Berlin, uh, is the Altus Museum. Uh, this is from the 1820s, uh, also by Schinkel. And we see another postcard view. Uh, we see this as really uh, inspired uh, by the Agora, the, the ancient Greek Agora in Athens, which was less of a temple. It, it, the Agora wasn't a temple. It was a market hall, and it was just this long building with an open colonnade that sort of sheltered the market uh, stalls that were inside of it. And the Agora was kind of the main central plaza of ancient Athens with the, with the Acropolis was on the hill next to that. But the Agora was kind of where, you know, people did business and shopped and all that. And so there were these long buildings, you know, colonnaded buildings with a roof on it, but it, it was sort of open inside where, uh, where people could um, set up their shopping stalls and be protected while they shopped or did business. And so this is a similar uh, sort of form to that. Uh, but it, once again, we see a large volume or mass on top of the building. And this is, um, I'll show you a little bit surprising uh, what that actually is. So here is a more contemporary view of it. I took this photo uh, in 2009, uh, and you can see, you know, very traditional uh, ionic again uh, colonnade with an entablature on that, uh, and behind it is a, um, a recess to create kind of a, a loggia. But there's a, a walls with plaster, um, sort of faux marble plaster decorations. You can see that a little more clearly here, and this is just a very large. Um, sort of portico for the museum, which is, you know, in the building in behind it. I'll show you a floor plan here in a moment. Here's a view standing in that recessed area, and you can see the faux painted marble walls along the side. This looks like marble, but it's actually uh, fresco plaster to, to look like marble. I guess it was a cheap way of, of making that look like that. But, you know, very, very nicely detailed uh, colonnade here. But in plan, here's the, the grand staircase and that recessed portico we saw out front. And then in the interior is a more traditional layout there. But there is a central rotunda dome here in the middle. Uh, you can see grand staircases on either side. And then this was built as a museum. And so all around here are the galleries uh, for the museum. Um, and this would have been, you know, showing art and, and uh, artistic elements. Again, a, a a kind of a new building type that did not exist in the Renaissance era, uh, and so they had no they had no formula. You know, the Romans didn't build museums. The the Renaissance architecture didn't build museums. Uh, we start to see museums in the late 
uh, 18th, early 19th century as, as a play, public place to sh display art and, and culture. And so, um, you know, what we see is a series of galleries that go around and around with two central uh, light courts to allow natural lighting in here because they, they don't have artificial lighting yet to illuminate the art. And then at the very center is a public space, uh, which is this rotunda. What's a little surprising about this building, and I'll show you an exterior view again in a minute, is that the central rotunda, which we've seen often, right, with Palladio, with the Villa Rotunda, or with um, the, the, the Neo-Palladian uh, houses and palaces and churches even, um, but in this museum, they're they're actually hiding the fact that this is a dome. On the outside, we didn't see the fact that it is a domed space. It it was surrounded, and you can kind of see this by these squared off parapet walls. Uh, kind of a strange approach to the idea of we did you know Shinko didn't want to to make it look like there was a dome sitting on this building. So when you walk inside and you discover that there is a dome and it's it's a very Pantheon-like dome. In fact, it's a it's really sort of a, a neoclassical replication of the Pantheon itself. Uh, there's a colonnade around it. There's the coffers in the ceilings. Uh, the skylight oculus at the top isn't open to the air like the Pantheon in Rome is, but it's it's got the skylight, uh, but it's it's that same form and then all around the drum and the base here are you know various sculptures on display uh, just the way the pantheon was built uh, to display sculptures of the various gods originally and and when it was converted to a church they would have had sculptures of you know biblical figures and saints and so forth um, but none of this is apparent when you're first coming to the building here's the exterior view again and it's that the idea that there's a dome in there is completely hidden. This is something really kind of new and radical. The idea uh, before we had seen that sort of space expressed on the exterior, you saw a very prominent dome. Now, when we look at the exterior, the top of the building, and you have to look back, this is, this is some lighting scaffold or something on top here, but you can see that squared off mass in behind there. That's, you know, doesn't, that's high dome. And so you don't really realize it until you go inside. That this is a new kind of um, approach to architecture that hasn't really existed uh, much um, up until this time. And I want to one other thing I want to point out before we conclude this chapter. And um, there's another great German architect that we will be talking about later in the semester. Uh, completely different style and approach to architecture, but he. Um, he knew Berlin very well, and he was very inspired by the work of Schinkel. He never wanted to replicate it. Uh, he, you know, this he thought of this architecture as in the past, uh, but he he really felt that Schinkel detailed and proportioned his buildings extremely well, and he uh, was inspired in many ways to create a modern 20th century version of the work that Schinkel was doing in the late 18th and early uh, 19th century. And here is an image of a building that is very much inspired by the Altus Museum. I think all of you should recognize this. We'll certainly be talking about it later, but uh, it's in your own city here of Chicago, right? Um, everybody know what this is? Crown Hall. Uh, Crown Hall, yeah, Mies van der Rohe. So uh, certainly one of the most important 20th century architects. And there's, um, you know, definitely a direct link between Schinkel and Mies van der Rohe, who we'll be talking about later. All right. So that ends the 18th century um, and uh, the architecture of, you know, the Baroque and the, and the sort of evolution into neoclassical, neo-Palladianism.